Well, good afternoon, everyone. So pleased that you could be with us today. My name is Amy Johnson. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs here at Carolina, and we are pleased to bring you another mental health seminar that I think will be a great discussion for this afternoon, Finding Balance in a Digital World. For those of you who haven't regularly joined us for these seminars, we launched this series about two years ago now in response to our global mental health crisis with a goal to educate and support our students, faculty, and staff, as well as reduce stigma, build resilience, and encourage help-seeking behavior among our community. Following our mental health summit in fall of 2021, we launched our Heals Care Network initiative. Uh, and if you don't already have the Heals Care Network website booked, I encourage you to do so, care.unc.edu. We launched that initiative to actively support and foster Carolina's culture of compassion and care. So our commitment to an ongoing conversation about mental health and well-being continues, and we're glad to have you with us for today's session. I don't think the potential irony is lost on any of us that we're doing a seminar about finding balance in a digital world on Zoom, which has become an online tool that is practically essential to both our personal and professional lives. And therein lies our challenge in that our digital tools, as with so many things really, can be both assets and liabilities. Finding a way to maximize the benefits and minimize the burdens becomes a task that all of us are grappling with. So today, our facilitator, Dr. Annie Mayhew, will share insights as to how technology can affect our well-being and help us identify strategies that we can use to foster healthy tech use and find our own digital wellness and equilibrium. I have just a few keynotes today before we begin uh, the seminar to help you navigate. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for CLE credit, the QR code will be provided at the end of the program. The chat is enabled for participants to communicate both with each other and with our production team behind the scenes during the session. And the Q&A is also available and we'll turn to those questions following Dr. Mayhew's presentation. Please know that anonymous questions are also welcomed. Participants will be able to see all questions and you can upvote any questions that you'd like to support. So with that, I'd like to turn over uh, to our facilitator and offer a brief introduction. We're fortunate to have with us today to facilitate Dr. Annie Mayhew, who is the Assistant Professor of Psychology here at Carolina and the Winston Family Distinguished Fellow at the Winston National Center on Technology Use, Brain and Psychological Development. Dr. Mayhew's research examines sociocultural and technological influences on adolescent development with a focus on three key outcomes, mental health, sexual behavior, and academic engagement. She studies how gender roles, societal scripts, digital media, and peers affect development and adjustment, seeking to understand and ameliorate disparities to enhance well-being. Dr. Mayhew received her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Vermont and her master's and her doctoral degrees from the University of Pittsburgh, the latter in developmental and social psychology. We're so pleased to have you with us today, Annie, and are eager to delve into this topic with you. As I know, as mentioned, it's of significant interest to many of you, us. So I thank you again for being with us today and I will turn the proverbial mic over to you. Thank you so much. Let me share my slides here. Well, thank you. Thank you to the Heals Care team for having me here today. And thank you to you all for being here to talk about this really important topic that I think affects us all in lots of really complex ways. So yes, my talk today is going to be about finding balance in a digital world. And it's not so simple, right, as just the bad or the good. It's about really trying to understand how can we make digital media work for us. So who am I? I, uh, as Amy mentioned, I um, just recently graduated with my PhD from uh, the University of Pittsburgh. I originally grew up, though, in Vermont in a very rural town of about 1,200 people. This is a picture of me very early in my life. I think I was 16 there with a flip phone, which shows that you know, the transition from the previous era of technology to what we're currently dealing with, uh, I've seen a lot of that change. Um, so I'm a recent graduate, and that means that I'm new to UNC. I just started as an assistant professor in August, and I just moved to Chapel Hill, and I absolutely love it. I feel so grateful 
to be a part of this incredible community that I think um, is really concerned and thoughtful about kind of keeping the perspective of what really matters. And I'm really grateful to be a part of that. And part of my job is running a research lab. So I study adolescent development and my lab is called the Social Environments and Adolescence Lab. Here we are, we're a small group currently, but we're growing. This is us in front of the old well a couple of weeks ago. And I'm also part of something called the Winston National Center on Technology Use, Brain and Psychological Development, which is a relatively new center here at UNC that really is focused on understanding how digital media affects teens. So young people, we're thinking like middle school and high school, and we're trying to enhance wellness by understanding both the positives and the negatives of social media and digital media use. And if you're interested in checking us out, we are on the internet. So just to get started here, I want to invite everyone to take a few deep breaths. When we take deep breaths, all kinds of wonderful things happen. Our heart rate slows down. We get more oxygen in the bloodstream. This kind of signals to our brain that it's time to relax. We can increase endorphins, which are those feel-good chemicals in the brain. I want to invite us to take some deep breaths in part because this talk is not just about me presenting you with the facts of digital media, that, although I'll do a bit of that, but also helping us and inviting us as a community to really think about how we want to use digital media and the tools that are available to us to enhance well-being. There's um, an artist that I really like in California named Ramin Nazar, who does these um, like cartoons. And this one really, really speaks to me. He says that before meditation, we're kind of in the maze. We see the, the big walls in front of us that we can't see over. But after meditation or after any kind of mindful practice, after taking a few deep breaths, we can get a bit of perspective, right? We can see more what we're dealing with instead of feeling like what we're dealing with is all around us. And sometimes when I'm engaging in breathing practices or meditation or mindful practices, I like to think about some similar visuals. So sometimes I feel like I'm in the clouds of my thoughts and my emotions and they're swirling all around me and I'm really identifying with them. And then when I take a step back, I'm able to feel like those things are out in front of me and I can look carefully at what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking and what behavioral urges I'm having. For example, if I'm feeling like I need to reach for my phone, why is that happening? Why is that coming up? And similarly, we can think about this in terms of a sports match, right? If we're in a tennis match, the things that are coming at us quickly, we have to respond to. We have no time to take a step back and think if the thoughts or the feelings or the behaviors that we're engaging with are the ones that we really actually want to be having and doing. And so with a bit of perspective, taking that step back and a bit of deep breathing, we can see the tennis match of our thoughts and our feelings and our urges out in front of us. And we can take that step back to think, for example, is this the time I wanna reach for my phone? Is this a, a way that I wanna use digital media in my own life to enhance my well-being? So before we dive into the topics today, I wanna to invite you to just share with us all what comes to mind when you think of the term digital world. It might be anything, could be something very specific, could be positive or negative experiences. And you'll see that to access the poll, you can either go to the website that's listed on the top left of the screen, or you can send a text to that um, number with the, the like name of my poll everywhere. So you're welcome to share multiple different responses if you have multiple words that come to mind. And also if you wanna share uh, a compound um, set of words, like you want two words to go together, you can put a little hyphen between them to make sure that they stay stuck together. Otherwise, they spread out. So it looks like people are thinking about advancement and technological growth, this really vast sense of the world, that we're living life inside of technology, rather than maybe technology being something that serves us. This is a world where everything's online, like this seminar right now where our screens and our phones and social media are really kind of at the forefront. Things are very visual, it sounds like. Google plays a big role. Things are maybe gonna be remote in a digital world, just like this Zoom webinar. Looks like distraction is something that comes to mind for some people. Looks like both the good and the bad are things that come to mind. There's some benefits, right? But also some potential detriments. 
virtual reality, connection, disconnect, right? So it sounds like you all agree with me that the, the idea of a digital world comes with these really complex set of opportunities, some that are really great and that we might want to capitalize on, and others that could be potentially harmful or potentially get in the way of our kind of bigger picture or of our values and how we want to live our lives. Time waster. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. So I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the big picture of what I'm going to share today. So first, I'll give you a bit of an overview of what is digital media and share a bit of the research on this topic to kind of help you think more about how these tools can be used in your own life and also give you some of the language that we use in the research literature to kind of address the specific things about digital media that make them unique and potentially harmful or helpful. And then we'll talk about how digital media can harm us. And unfortunately, there are many, many ways that it can do so. And I'll address just a few of those. Also, we'll talk about the ways digital media can potentially help us. There are ways that we can leverage digital media to help us live out our values and make um, the kinds of decisions that we want to make to spend our time the way we want to spend it. And then finally, we'll get to the practical strategies. You are stronger than the pull of your phone and the pull of those things on digital media that you don't want to spend your time doing. And so we'll think about some ways really, um, really practically to address some of these problems. So let's dive into what is digital media. So you've probably seen some headlines like these. This is just a smattering of the kinds of things that the media says about digital media. And a lot of that is targeted towards young people. So I study teenagers, but we know that development happens over a long period of time from childhood through adolescence, through young adulthood and into adulthood. People are using smartphones and there's all kinds of different ways that some of these negative effects might happen across different age groups. So these headlines kind of beg the question, then is digital media bad for us? Well, the research is kind of still out on this. There's a lot of research going on in this area. It's a really kind of hot topic right now that people are trying to understand when it comes to trying to promote well-being among adolescents and among people of all ages. But really critically, one of the kind of consensus points that the field has come to on this is that it's not just about how much time you're spending on digital media. We recently have kind of tried to move away from this focus on screen time and think more broadly about what are the specific things that we're doing on digital media that potentially help or harm us. And this helps us to really reframe the discussion about digital media to focus on the specific behaviors and the subjective experiences that we're, ha that we're having when we're using digital and screen media. So the question, is digital media bad or good, is not necessarily the right question to ask. It's kind of an oversimplification of what we're dealing with here. And I think it's more helpful to think about digital media as this double-edged sword. It's one that potentially exploits our vulnerabilities, these vulnerabilities that are inherent in us as people, and perhaps especially for young people, things like wanting to connect with others and be part of a community, wanting to have information and excitement and stimulation. But it also provides us with opportunities to do some of those same things, to connect with people, to get information, to be entertained. And so one important theoretical framework, and this is the most kind of research heavy part of the talk that I'll get to today, is that I want to share with you something called the transformation framework. This is a th theoretical framework that some folks actually at UNC developed that focuses on what they call the features of social media. So these are the specific aspects of social and other digital media that transform our experiences from the offline world to the online world. And these specific features are a way to help us think about what is it about digital media that's different? What is it that feels so different from our in, per our in person or offline lives? And so here are what those features are. The first is that social media and most digital media is highly visual. This means that for the most part on these apps and platforms, there's a strong emphasis on things like photos and videos. And sometimes this can move into the direction of being an emphasis on physical appearance, which can have negative impacts on body image. 
Digital media also, unlike any kind of in-person interaction opportunity, is constantly available. So 24-7, you have access to your phone and you're able to text a friend or go on Instagram and use those devices in ways that we previously weren't able to have these constant interactions with people. The things that are put on social media and digital media generally are relatively permanent. Again, this is really different than in-person experiences because when you're talking to someone live and maybe you say something that you think maybe was the wrong thing to say, there's no one recording it for the most part. Usually you can have a conversation and people forget what you said. But if something is posted online, that can have really negative impacts if that thing that's posted is something you don't want other people to see. This can also mean that anything posted online is available in perpetuity, such as things like positive um, videos or images or information. And similarly, these things that are posted are usually highly public, which means that, for example, when we take a photo of ourselves and post it on a digital media platform, we're able to reach a really wide audience in a way that we previously weren't able to in the offline world. <clears throat> Asynchronicity is another feature of digital media. So right now we're having this Zoom meeting that's synchronous, meaning that people who are here currently are able to hear me talk in real time, but we're also recording the video so that in another time, someone could come and watch this video, allowing for that asynchronous interaction. Even if we're not actually having a conversation in real time, we can communicate with each other across time. And this is true for things like text messaging too. Whereas in, in person, usually when you're talking to someone, there's really live and quick back and forth, but over digital media, when you're talking to someone, you can take time to think about what you're gonna say, for example, or there can be a lapse in communication. Digital media also has very few cues, social cues, things like tone of voice or facial expressions or body language, the things that make human interactions really rich and often very meaningful. Digital media is pretty much void of these to different degrees. And this means that sometimes when we're interacting with people on digital media, we can misunderstand what they're saying or we can feel a lack of connection to them. It can also sometimes mean that we feel less inhibited and we might be likely to say something online that we won't, wouldn't say in person. Digital media also allows for these quantifiable metrics of things like peer approval or peer status or likability. So things like the number of likes, the number of comments, the number of friends, this ability to quantify and put into a number these different components of our social experiences is really unique relative to the offline world when you might maybe generally know how many friends you have, but you can't see it in a really clear number. And then finally, the last feature is that social media, for the most part, is very algorithmic. So this means that the things that we're seeing on these different digital media platforms are curated largely by the tech companies to provide us with things that we might think are engaging or interesting or perhaps very sensational. And this can include positive or negative things. But the goal with these algorithms is largely to keep us on these platforms looking at the content. So to break this down in terms of your actual experiences on digital media, you could, for example, get um, notifications from friends through an app, and they may, you may be able to respond to them at any time, day or night. This highlights that 24-7, you have the available, you have access to these platforms, whether it's through an app or using your phone or even FaceTiming. The Things that we post on social media are often highly visual. So this is a post from a colleague of mine, Dr. Jackie Nisi, who was a graduate student here at UNC a while ago. And this is a picture of her new baby. And so we can see here that the main focus of this post is the image. It's not, for example, what she's saying in the comments. And we can also see that this was posted at a much earlier time point. So we're able to interact with this content and potentially like it or comment on it, even without having that synchronous live interaction with Jackie. It's also relatively permanent. It was posted a couple years ago, but it's still online, still accessible for us to see. And we can't see much evidence of Q of cues here because we don't have access to, for example, Jackie's tone of voice as she's describing this post to us or her facial expressions. This shows that there's really limited interaction with these sort of like rich human components, things like um, body language. And then we can also see that the number of likes is quantified. It's a number. 
it shows us that 296, 97 people have liked this photo. So we could take that number and compare it to other likes we've gotten on other photos if we wanted to maybe compare how well uh, we're doing in terms of approval to other people. And we can also see from this that there's evidence that this is highly public. Never before in human history was it possible to have 300 people view a photo of our baby and provide feedback on whether or not they like that photo. And then finally, many social media platforms have these opportunities for us to see um, content that's provided by the app or by the company. These are things that are algorithmically produced. So these feeds are curated by the companies. These are not necessarily things that we might follow or that we might select for ourselves to see. They're the things that are selected for us to encourage us to stay on the platforms longer. So now that we have some language to talk more about digital media and its different features and the way that it potentially influences us, we can ask how digital media might hurt us, how it might have negative impacts on our lives. So I invite you again to share what you think the worst part of digital media is, what you think the part that you really hate, you really don't want to experience anymore, the parts that you think are bad for yourself or for society. Cyberbullying is definitely a terrible, terrible part of digital media. Misinformation is rampant, especially when it comes to certain political content. Social comparison is really, really common. We'll talk about that in just a second. There's a lot of judgment, right? People make decisions about who they think we should be. And that's um, often shared on social media in part because of the cue absence. People feel comfortable saying potentially mean things. Yeah, FOMO and doxing, misinformation. Again, these are all really important negative parts of digital media. Personal information, privacy. It is so easy to fake things. I often see photos that I think are really cool and then I do a quick Google search and realize that they're completely fake. Yes, the need for external validation is a big part of these quantifiable metrics of approval of putting out our information very publicly and hoping that other people respond in positive ways. Scams, death threats, terrible, terrible things, right? There's so much about digital media that we didn't really have to deal with in the pre-digital world that now we're having to deal with and having to grapple with and having to figure out if it's worth some of these other potential benefits. Okay, to move on, I wanna share this image. This is Mark Zuckerberg, you probably know. He started Facebook, which is now called Meta. And this is um, not actually the most current, but the, um, the prior mission of the company, the mission of Facebook, or at least the stated mission, is to give people the power to share and make the world a more open and connected place. Now, that mission sounds absolutely wonderful, doesn't it? That sounds lovely. People being able to share, to be open, and to be connected across the world. These are some of the great benefits of social and digital media. But I want you to imagine briefly that you work at a tech company, let's say Meta, and your job is to create a new social media app. And so like most social media apps, users can join for free, right? If you've joined Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or Twitter, you know that you don't have to pay to access these sites. When you log in, you just create a username and a password, and then you're part of it. So that means that these companies have to get their revenue from somewhere, right? So if you are working at this tech company, then your job and your paycheck depends on advertising dollars, depends on these ad companies that pay you to show content to the users. So the more content you show to the users, the more you get them to engage with your content, to watch your content, to be on their phones and screens, the more money you make and the more successful you are at your job. So this means that your goal as a tech company, when you really boil it down, is to design an app that has the features and the content and the experiences that are as engaging as possible and that promote more use. So while we might think that social media and digital media have a lot of potential benefits for us, it's important to remember that digital media is not designed to benefit us. It is designed primarily to get advertising dollars for the companies that created those platforms. 
So you may have heard the term attention economy. This is an economic approach to the management of information. Essentially, it treats human attention as a scarce commodity, which it is. We can only focus on so many things at once. And so our attention is something that's valuable for companies to, um, to use up. If attention is a resource and we only have so much of it, then that means that we're actually not the buyer when it comes to these products. We are not the people who are buying or accessing these services. We are the product that's being sold. Our attention is being sold to the advertising companies. So in very simple terms, this means that the more people who are on these platforms and the more time that they spend on these apps means that there's more money for the tech companies. This is a really different system than a lot of other systems. For example, when we buy um, different products at the store, when we access housing and we're renting, in those cases, we're the buyers. But when it comes to the attention economy and to digital and social media, we're not the buyers. So what makes digital media so engaging? Well, every single thing about digital media has been designed very carefully to be exciting, to be thrilling, to provide these never ending possibilities of new information and potentially rewarding information and experiences. So social media platforms use a very, um, very specific format to try to hook us and keep us using those platforms so that they can make money. You may have heard of um, reward, um, variable reward systems. So this is basically the idea of a slot machine. With a slot machine, which is designed also to keep people coming back and using those, um, using those tools, the idea is that the rewarding stimuli is random. You never know when you're going to get rewarded and when you're not going to. And so the pull of the slot machine and the pull down on your screen to refresh or the infinite scroll that we have on different media platforms, these are designed primarily to keep us coming back, hoping that this is the time that we'll find something rewarding. So you could imagine if rewards were on a more constant schedule, every time that we pull the handle on the slot machine, we get a small reward. We might get kind of uh, disinterested if we pull it one time and there's no reward. The reason why variable rewards are so engaging and so rewarding is that we never know when we're going to get the reward that we're hoping to get. It keeps us coming back and it hooks us into this habitual behavior. And we've also seen, or you've probably seen, that when you try to disengage sometimes, you get peppered with these messages and bonus offers, things to get your attention and to pull you back in. And this is not an accident. This is by design. So this is a book written by the person who uh, actually created the infinite scroll mechanism. And this is a book that was created for software companies to build habit forming products. So their goal is to help us, is to force us to have this habit, this habitual checking where we're constantly going back to our devices or to the apps to try to see if we can get something rewarding, like another like on our photo, another comment, another notification. And so this means that we spend a lot of time on digital and screen media. 48% of people who are between 18 to 29 say that they're online almost constantly. Almost every moment that they're awake around the clock, they're checking social media or they're on a computer or they're on an iPad using these different tools. And Common Sense Media recently reported that for youth right now, this is for younger teenagers, the average time that young people spend on screen media per day is eight hours. That's a full-time job. That's tons and tons of time spent on these different media platforms. And some of that's potentially positive and some of that's negative. And a lot of that is time that could be spent doing other potentially beneficial things. And so when we do just a bit of math on the average lifespan in the United States. And this is from Half the Story, a nonprofit that really focuses on activism related to these issues. We see that the average time that young people today will spend on screen media in their entire lifetime is 30 years. 30 years, about a third of someone's life. I'm 31, so by this metric, I just started my life offline. That's an enormous amount of time to be spent using these tools. And if we're using these tools in ways that we don't agree with or that we don't value, we're wasting so much of our precious time. 
And so there is a uh, concept in the research literature called displacement or displacement effects of media or displacement theory. Essentially, this is the idea that if you had a bowl of water that was completely full all the way to the top and you dropped a pebble into that bowl, some of the water would have to go somewhere, right? That bowl can only hold so much. This is the idea of displacement. We have exactly 24 hours every day. And so every time that we do something, anything, it's also simultaneously a decision to not do every other possible thing. And so if screen media is soaking up eight hours of our day, 30 years of our life, then that is time that we're not getting to focus on some of the things that really matter and that make life worth living. For example, spending time with friends or traveling or seeing the ocean at sunset and seeing the sun, reading a book. How many of us have recently read a book? If you have, I'm very impressed. I have trouble focusing on books these days. Spending time alone in quiet contemplation or prayer. These are things that really matter, that make life worth living. And if we're focused on our screens, we might not have as much time to do these really valuable things. And so it's not just that media takes time away from these valuable offline activities, but it can also actively cause us stress and make us feel negative emotions. And it's largely because of these features that I described previously. So digital stress is the broad idea that there's a negative impact of technology and the digital world more broadly on our well-being, that there can be negative mental and physical effects. For example, one component of digital stress is the pressure to be available all the time to respond to our family or our friends or post things online. This refers or this reflects back on the 24 seven availability of digital media and these opportunities for asynchronous communication. We might also feel that the communication that's coming at us through text messages and WhatsApp and DMs and email that we're just overloaded with communication. And part of this is because the, that communication is not the same as these really rich and often beautiful experiences we have with other people in person. We're missing the opportunity to see someone smile or to hear them laugh or to give them a hug. And so that constant barrage of communication can just feel like too much and not satisfying enough. Other components of digital stress include feeling really anxious about getting approval from other people. And again, this relates back to the, the visual component. If we're posting a picture of ourselves, it's a very vulnerable place to be. And we wanna feel that other people like that photo or like us as a person. And the quantifiable nature of social media can really exacerbate this anxiety. If we see, for example, someone else is getting a lot of likes on their posts, but we aren't. And similarly, this can make us feel FOMO, as someone mentioned, fear of missing out. This is especially true because of how public social media is. For example, if our friends post something online that indicates that they were all getting together without us, that can be incredibly challenging to see, and that can lead to a lot of stress and negative emotions. We also know that social comparison, as people also mentioned, can have negative impacts on our body image and mental health. And this is largely because social media is so, so visual. It really emphasizes photos and videos, and in turn really emphasizes the physical attractiveness of the people in those photos and videos. And so we often engage in social comparison and specifically upward social comparison where we're seeing people who we think look better than us or have better, happier lives than us and comparing to those people. And that can make us feel really crummy. We also see on social media that there are these impossible standards of beauty, people that show up on our feeds that look like no real person looks because they've been edited and highly manipulated so much. And we also tend to see these highlight reels from people. So we only see about half of the things that are really going on in their lives and they're carefully curating what they're presenting, which can then make us feel really crummy about ourselves because we know the full story of our lives but are only seeing the highlights and the, the prettiest pictures of other people's lives. And this relates to an experience that I've spent a lot of time studying called appearance-related social media consciousness, which is the idea that how we think about the audience on social media viewing us can kind of seep into our consciousness and affect us day to day, even when we're not using social media. So for example, we might be out in the world, not on our phones, but think about how we might look if a picture of us was taken and posted on social media. So it's the idea that our physical appearance kind of creeps into our daily life and can have this really negative effect. 
that is linked to things like depressive symptoms and disordered eating. So that's a lot of negative things. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But I think it it forces us to ask this question, is it all bad? Is everything that we do on digital media bad for us? And that brings me to the next point I wanna make, which is that there are some ways that digital media can help us or that we can leverage digital media to live the lives we wanna live. So again, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What is the best part of digital media? That's lovely. Yeah, communication, being able to talk to other people that we care about, so wonderful. And long distance friends, the availability of social media really allows us to do that. Puppies, I love puppies. Connection, yes. It's this really, really valuable way that we can stay in touch with people. Oh yeah, it's so practical. We can make plans. Communication seems like it's coming up a lot. That's awesome. I also agree that's the best part. Possibilities to learn things, to maybe check out a YouTube video and learn how to cook. Yeah, we can use media together. So I don't know, if we're playing a video game, sitting on the couch together, that's a really fun shared activity. Yes, talking updates. Yeah, we can learn a lot about what's going on, maybe in people's lives that we care about or maybe in the world. Sleep noises, that's nice. Humor, yes, oh my gosh, memes, so funny. I think the best time to be alive in terms of memes. Communities, awesome, I'm gonna bring that up later too. Yeah, so it sounds like so many of the best benefits of digital media really focus on this ability to connect with other people, to feel like we're part of something bigger, mostly puppies. <laughs> awesome, thank you all for sharing. Uh, okay, so I want to share this brief video. I don't know if others have seen this before. This came out about 14 years ago, which makes me feel old because I remember when it came out. Um, it's one of the most joyful things that I have ever seen. Look, I can be a shark. Now my whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my moms. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my mom. I like my hair. I like my haircuts. I like my pajamas. I like my stuff. I like my rooms. I like my whole house. My whole house is great. I can do anything good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do anything good. Better than anyone. Better than anyone. Look, I can... So I feel better already, don't you? <laughs> There's so much fun and lighthearted silliness online. And this really highlights that there are ways that digital media can provide us opportunities through a lot of these same mechanisms to feel good, to feel happy, to feel joy. And so one of those or many of those relate to learning and entertainment, getting information or just seeing something really funny and joyful or silly or even something that's not funny, but that brings us a sense of um, contentment that's entertaining. It's a nice distraction. We know that some time spent mindlessly scrolling is wasted, but some of it's not. Some of it's really wonderful. Some of it is exactly the way I want to spend time. And this is largely because of the availability of social media, that these things are posted publicly. Things like videos can be funny and that they're permanent. We can go and access this video that was posted 14 years ago, and without fail, it will make me feel happy. It's also true that some of the information that we see online, things like learning different hobbies or um, information about elections, for example, some of those are garbage, but a lot are not. And we can learn so much about the world and our place in it by using digital media. And then perhaps the most valuable aspect of digital media, at least in my opinion, is the ability to connect with other people. We can talk to friends, and this is largely because social media is available all the time and because we can have these asynchronous conversations. We can text a friend who's in a totally different time zone and they can text us back when they wake up. What a wonderful way to stay connected with people over long distances. We can also see how people are doing if they post, you know, a picture of their 
wedding or their new baby online. This gives us a great opportunity to kind of stay abreast of what they're doing and what they're interested in. And this is largely, again, because of the publicness of digital media. We can share a funny meme or a funny video or a funny quote or an inspiring or uplifting quote. And this is largely because of the visualness. So even though the visualness can make us feel really bad in some instances, it can also offer us this incredible opportunity to laugh and to feel joy and to connect with other people. More broadly, <clears throat> we can use digital media to make new friends. So it's great to stay in contact with friends that we know from prior experiences, but we can also make totally new friends, people who maybe we eventually meet offline or maybe we only ever know on online, but they can still be really valuable sources of connection. And again, this is because of those same features that we discussed earlier. We can also use digital media to build or join new communities and we can see representation. We can find role models, people who look like us or have had similar experiences to us. And again, this is largely because of the visualness of digital media. And I think one of the most important, unique opportunities of digital media is for people who are facing marginalization. So for example, people who are racial and ethnic minority communities, people in the LGBTQ community, going online to see people who look like you, if those people are not in your in-person environments, or hearing stories about people who have faced similar challenges and overcome them, these things can be incredibly valuable. And we see some of the greatest benefits for digital media among youth, among queer and trans youth. It can also provide uh, this access to community for people who maybe have a certain community need that they can't access in person. So being part of a community, being part of something bigger and having access to things like role models and accurate information, these things are so, so valuable. And this might be for someone with a marginalized identity, but it could also be broader. Someone who has maybe a rare diagnosis, who wants to learn more about the experiences of living with that diagnosis. They can access other people online who have had similar experiences. And critically too, all of these things can come together when we think about people living in rural communities where those in-person communities and in-person experiences can sometimes be harder to find. So then is it possible that we could access some of these benefits and try to avoid some of these negative effects? We wanna understand then how can we make digital media work for us? So, to get to some of these practical strategies. On the topic of memes, I don't know if anyone remembers this gem. This was when there was that huge boat that was stuck in the Suez Canal. And clearly this little crane that's trying to dig it out is um, sort of like a, a sad solution relative to maybe something that's more at scale. And so maybe you have heard when, for example, you've had mental health challenges, people have told you, have you tried mindfulness? Have you tried meditating? Similarly, racism? Well, have you tried mindfulness? Obviously, these are really, really silly responses to these really big and enormous problems that people face. And similarly, these tech giants, their main goal is to control your attention. And so mindfulness maybe seems like a small um, solution that we can use, but it is one that we have control over. So mindfulness really at its core is not just about, you know, meditating or breathing. It's about broadly being open and attending with awareness to your experience. This means really thinking from a critical lens about what's happening. What thoughts are you having? What emotions are you having? What is it that you feel an urge to do and reflecting on those processes in a way that takes a step back? So you're looking at the clouds or you're looking at the tennis match rather than feeling like you're stuck in a part of it. And in the social sciences, we have this pretty well-established um, set of steps in the um, behavioral change process. So pre-contemplation, this is the step where you haven't yet acknowledged that there's some behavior that you want to change. You're still just engaging in that behavior and not really questioning it. We are all past this step already because we are here in this webinar starting to realize the digital media might be a problem that we want to address. So the step that we're at now is contemplation. This is essentially acknowledging that there is a problem, but still being not totally sure how we wanna address it, not totally sure what it is that we want to change. So mindful media use asks us to do a few things. The first is really to start by paying attention, which is easier said than done. Some ways that we can do this 
include pausing before you reach for your phone, asking yourself maybe what exactly is it that you plan to do when you unlock your phone? What is your intention with this use? How much time do you plan to spend and on which apps? We can also pay attention to our emotions as we're using the phone or as we're using the device. So you could do something that we've called a slow scroll, which is slowing down as you're moving through whatever it is on your feed that you're looking at and really taking stock of how you're processing what you're seeing, what emotions are coming up for you as you're engaging in those behaviors. And reminders can be a really helpful way for us to stay aware rather than to just start aware and then get lost in the digital world. So reminders like screen time limits or setting uh, alarms on your phone, these can kind of break the spell of mindless digital media use. They can offer us this kind of quick prompt where we can check back in and decide if we're using media in a way that aligns with our values or if we want to reevaluate and do something else. So the next step then when we've really thought carefully about what it is that we maybe want to change is the preparation phase. This is where we're getting determined and getting ready to make that change. And here what we want to do is ask some unfortunately tough questions. We want to say to ourselves, what is it that I want to change about my tech use and why do I want to make that change? So it can be helpful here to really reflect on the reasons. For example, what is it that your phone has gotten in the way of? What is it that you want to be doing with your time that you're not doing because you're spending time sucked into digital media? And you can elaborate here too on specific examples, specific things and how they've created some specific problems for you. This can help to make the problem really real. And really useful here too is to look forward. Think about if you were to make this change, what would it improve in your life? And from there, we can go to the action phase. This is the phase where we're really harnessing our willpower and we're deciding and we're going forward to change our behavior. So we need to figure out how we're gonna do that. The first thing that I strongly recommend is setting aside some time to focus on this and to make a decision. If you just kind of think that maybe digital media could serve a different purpose in your life and kind of hope that it would change, it's likely not going to. It likely is gonna require you to really focus on how you want to use digital media in your life and how you want digital media to serve your values. So again, this requires you to step back from the clouds, from the tennis match, and really make some decisions about what's happening. Really importantly, you want to make some decisions too about what tech use you want to keep. Because of course, there are things that are good. There are things that might be really practical. If we were all to just switch to a flip phone world, we would probably lose the ability to stay connected with people in long distances. It would take us forever to type on the uh, flip phone keypad. So there are some things that tech is, is beneficial for in your life. And you can decide what those things are and decide how you're going to keep them in your life. And then you want to decide on which parts are not working for you. And this is really where we want, to, we want to focus our attention in terms of behavior change. These are the things that are the main culprits of distraction, of negative emotions. And as you're thinking through and being mindful about your digital media use, you might realize that it's certain apps or at certain times of the day, or it's when you're experiencing a certain emotion that you reach for your phone or you use your phone in a way that you don't want to use it. And so once we have made those decisions and we're enacting that change, we have to maintain that change, which is easier said than done. But it requires us to then just keep coming back, keep checking in and using some of these mindfulness uh, tactics that we've been talking about. Decide what's working well, what needs adjusting, how you're feeling about it. And again, block out some time where you're really focused on this particular decision and challenge that you're facing. It's really, really helpful to do this with someone else. Maybe it's a friend or a sibling or a parent, one or a couple other people that are really helping you to stay focused on your goals can be really beneficial and staying on track with how you want to use digital media. So this maintenance really re requires us to kind of consistently revisit how we're doing. And this can be challenging to enact unless we have put it, for example, in our calendar, we know that once a week, maybe on Sunday nights or once a month on the first of the month, we're going to sit back and we're going to think, what am I doing with my time? How am I spending it on digital media that benefits me? And how am I spending it in ways that harm me? Am I really living my values online and offline? This has to be a core part 
of your daily or weekly or monthly schedule. And the hardest part about maintaining these changes is going to be those really hard days, the stressful days, the busy days, the times when we have some big task to complete that we really don't want to have to do and we're reaching for our phone constantly to distract us. It's the times when we're feeling afraid, maybe of being rejected or disliked, the times we don't want to be alone with our thoughts. These are the times when having firm values and decisions about how you want to coexist with technology are going to be most essential and require you to keep checking back in. And not always, but for many of us, we're going to experience this relapse or going kind of back and forth between the digital habits that we want to engage in and the ones that we don't want to engage in. And that's totally normal. And when this happens, there's only one thing you need to do. It's just to be kind to yourself because it is really, really hard. There is a $5.2 trillion industry working against you and your decisions about being in control of your tech use. And it's important to remember that digital wellness is really a process. It's not a destination. It's a moving target that we're going to keep working at every day. And so in the last few minutes, I want to share with you a couple options for things that you might consider as healthy tech habits that you want to incorporate into your life. And you can do some of these or none of these or different options. These are just ways to help you think more about some options that you might have in terms of changes that you might want to make. So you might Im implement some rule for yourself that there are certain tech-free times or places. This is really to take back some of that control about when and where tech is a part of your life. So for example, you might say, I won't use my phone during dinner or in the evenings or first thing in the morning. You might charge your phone in another room or on the another side of the room so you don't pick it up and stay in bed and scroll. You might say, I'm not going to use my phone in bed or on the couch or in another location. You might have one day a week where you limit or cut out all phone or digital media use, or you might have some friends that you want to get together with and you have a little basket and you ask them to flop their phone in the basket so that you can be together really, really intentionally. Other ways that you might make changes include reducing distraction and trying to limit overuse. So there's lots of ways you can do this. You could decide for yourself which apps are really addictive and delete them or take breaks from them. You can set time limits on your apps using the screen time functions. Those are available on Android and iPhone phones. You can also disable notification for some or all of your apps, especially if things keep popping up that are pulling your attention away when you're trying to focus on something that you care about. You could say to yourself, I'm going to use social media, but only on the computer, not on this phone that's constantly in my pocket everywhere I go and always available. You might put your phone on do not disturb when you're with friends or engaging in an activity that you don't want to be disturbed during. You can also use apps. For example, there's an app called the Freedom app that blocks distracting websites. So it's a way to keep you from engaging maybe with certain um, escape forms of digital media that you actually don't want to deal with. There's also something called uh, distraction-free YouTube, which is something you can download on your browser. It's a way where if you're using YouTube, it limits um, the autoplay function. So it doesn't automatically play another video. It hides the recommendations and the related videos that pop up at the end of the video you're watching. So it's a way to limit these distractions and limit the pull to keep engaging with the technology. You can also say to yourself, you're going to do something like check email in batches or check your text messages in batches. And there's um, a software called Inbox When Ready that allows you to see what's in your email inbox only when you tell it that you're ready. <clears throat> and then we might also try to increase our awareness of technology use. So this could be like focusing on the screen time app or turning that app into a widget on your home screen so you can see the screen time at any um, anytime you unlock your phone, it's a reminder for you how much time you're spending on your phone. You can rearrange the location of the apps, shuffle them around so that next time you kind of mindlessly go to check something, you're reminded that that was not what you intended to do a couple hours ago when you rearrange the apps. You can disable face ID and this might reduce the mindless unlocking of your phone. So we might think about ways to kind of increase what we call friction, make it just a little bit harder to do the things that you really don't want to mindlessly do. It's also helpful to find some alternatives to replace the mindless scrolling that you specifically want to avoid. So for example, I really like doing Wordle because there's one a day. You can't get sucked into it for too long. It's fun. It's a nice distraction, but it's limited in terms of how much time you spend on it. 
<clears throat> you can also be thoughtful about who you're following, what you're seeing when you're scrolling and unfollow the accounts that don't make you feel good and follow the ones that make you feel good so that when you're scrolling, you have a better experience. And then finally, we can actually use tech apps and software for good or to help us achieve our goals. For example, there's meditation apps like Headspace and Calm. There's also meditation podcasts that you can access on your phone. You could use technology to reach out to friends a few times a week, be really intentional about it, or maybe try to FaceTime a friend once a week. You could put it on your calendar. You can use technology to keep a gratitude journal and keeping a reminder for yourself of the things that you're grateful for and happy about. You can also practice savoring pictures that bring you joy. So this is maybe instead of scrolling on social media, you heart some of the pictures that are of your puppy, for example, and you take time to look at those photos and feel the joy that those photos provide instead of mindlessly scrolling. And as people mentioned, you can also use tech to learn new things, learn a hobby or learn a new skill. There are YouTube tutorials and Reddit communities for just about everything you could ever be interested in doing. And all of these tips are from Dr. Jackie Nisi, who is now an assistant professor at Brown, but she has this great Substack channel called Techno Sapiens. So if some of this information was really interesting to you and you want to check out more, I recommend seeing her Substack. And Jackie's the one who did her PhD here at UNC. So to close, I'd love to hear if there are tech habits that you're interested in implementing. And it's okay if you, you don't know or if there's nothing, maybe you're really happy with the way you're using tech. But if there are ways that you wanna to try to change your tech use, I'd be really curious to hear what some of those ideas are. And they can be you know, really specific or they can be kind of half-baked ideas, things like spend less time on digital media. Yeah, so it seems like trying to limit the extent that technology is kind of bombarding us with notifications or whatever it might be when we're working or with friends can be really helpful. Spending less time on screens. Yeah. Scrolling as a form of procrastination. So real. I'll definitely relate to that. Yeah. Setting limits or going ahead and deleting these apps from your phone. Yes. I love the focus on really trying to connect with people in person, being with family or friends is a great time to put your phone away unless you need it for something urgent. Yes, so you have to search for it. That's a great idea. On my phone, I make it so that everything is really spread out. So I have to just scroll a bunch of times to get to my email app, which is all the way at the right. Yeah, setting limits or telling us, telling ourselves there's a certain time we're not gonna use technology can be so helpful, especially if we can set something really in stone, write it down and stick to it as much as possible. Tell other people in our lives and ask them to, Help us stick to it too. Yeah, zero tech just before work is done. Interesting. Phone basket. Well, that's what else likes that idea. I did that back when I was in college many years ago, before it was something anyone was talking about. But I feel like it's cool now. Doom scrolling. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing these. I'm so heartened to see that there were opportunities that y'all are excited to maybe take advantage of and ways that you might uh, think about using digital media for uh, to benefit you. So I'll just leave us with this one quote. This is from a book that I highly recommend called Time Management for Mortals. Oliver Berkman says, when you get to the end of your life, the sum total of all the things you paid attention to will have been your life. And I hope that we can take that idea and use it to empower us to use digital media for good and for our own values. Thank you all to my collaborators. Thank you all for being here and listening. And I'm excited to chat more and answer your questions. Annie, thanks so much. Uh, first of all, I have to say, I don't think we've ever had as many puppy references as we had <laughs> in this particular mental health seminar. So for me, that's a win. <laughs> good, a good day. Uh, and in particular, I really, one of the things that I enjoy doing when I need a little pick me up is checking out kids reactions in various videos. And so I loved that one video. I'm going to add that to my repertoire, but uh, really appreciate it. 
now is the time, everyone, when please uh, and agree, thank you, thank you, thank you, with all the applause that folks are sending out into the atmosphere, grateful for um, those reactions, please keep them coming. And the other thing we'd like you to keep coming is questions that you may have for Annie. <clears throat> And please put those in the Q&A so that we can indicate whether they're answered and dismissed and other people can read them and review them as well. Um, so while we give everybody a minute to throw a couple of those um, into the chat, or excuse me, into the Q&A, I just wanted to um, ask some questions that we typically ask folks. I And it, you already sort of uh, addressed this in part. Uh, one of the things that we often get is requests from folks, which is, if I want to read more, if I want to go and access more information or read a particular book about this, I know you acknowledge I too have trouble sitting down and staying focused on a book these days. Um, and so I appreciate it. Was it Dr. Jackie Nacy's um, that was very helpful. But if there are other resources beyond that that folks might um, be interested in, perhaps a book, perhaps some academic journals, do you have others that you might recommend? Or if you don't have this readily available today, could we steal that from you and put it up on our Heals Care Network website after the fact? Absolutely. I actually have a couple uh, available. Oh, perfect. Just prepared to share. So definitely recommend Jackie's Substack. That's a place where, where you'll find lots of information that's really applicable. Jackie is a researcher, but she's also a mom and she is someone who thinks really critically about these issues. And she knows a lot more about how to kind of take the research and really apply it to a person's life than I do. So I recommend checking that out. Um, I also recommend uh, the book that I showed briefly, 4,000 Weeks. It's not specifically about technology, but it is one that addresses the role of technology in our lives and kind of more broadly how we make decisions about how we spend our time. And technology, I think, is one of the core culprits that can eat away at that. Uh, and one other book that I'll recommend, actually two others. There's one that's called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari. Uh, and that book is um, really specifically about how digital media is kind of is stealing our focus, essentially. Um, that was a book that I listened to on audiobook and I couldn't, you know, put it down. I was like listening to it constantly. Um, and then the last book that I'll recommend is a book by Emily Weinstein and Carrie James. Uh, I actually don't have that title off the top of my head. Um, but they are at uh, it's called Behind Their Screens, What Teens Are Facing and Adults Are Missing. And so that book is really kind of targeted for parents and educators and can be helpful if you're thinking about supporting young people in their tech use. Um, and so I can provide all these uh, in, in a uh, curated list, but there's tons of resources out there for people who are interested in learning more. That's so helpful. Thank you for that. Uh, and I think you've tapped into a subject that I know is of interest to me. Uh, and it looks like maybe some other folks as well. Um, and there's also a particular plea for any podcast that you may have. <clears throat> so keeping with the theme of technology here, I know increasingly folks are listening to podcasts or audiobooks when they're in their cars, you know, um, interested in learning more and keeping that as educational processes uh, we can offer. A question that I think popped up in the chat and one uh, that I was interested in as well. So I'm imagining that we may have a number of parents who are on the Zoom today and particularly given your uh, specialized focus in adolescent, uh, adolescent development and behavior, for those of us who are parents of teens or tweens or who have cousins or you know nephews and nieces or what have you, how, what is the best way to talk with those um, individuals about this issue that we've talked about today? I, I noted that many of the strategies that we can use to sort of help us manage and be more mindful would apply. But, you know, to get my teenager as an example, and I think other folks may be in this boat, to sort of understand why that's important when he doesn't maybe acknowledge that there's a problem, do you have any particular strategies? And, and in particular, there's a question here in the chat about, uh, for example, a 10-year-old who's now being given their first phone, how should a parent explain their to their child the rules and boundaries of using social media? So any mm -hmm. advice you may have um, for us on that, I think would be most welcome. Yeah, well, I want to first just say that these are really big challenges and that, you know, as a society, we're still trying to figure out things like policies about young people using these devices and using social media. And we don't really have a clear answer yet of the best way to go about doing this. And so that's a real challenge, I think, for parents who are faced with having to do these things in real time without the kind of best and clearest recommendations. 
But I will say that I think one thing to keep in mind when we're talking to young people is that they are on those devices, they're accessing social media in part because there are some benefits to them doing so. And so when we're talking to them, we can be really thoughtful about asking them to tell us both what are the benefits and what are the detriments of being on screens. And most young people can say what the benefit is and what the detriment is, the things that they like doing, the things they don't like doing. And so inviting the young people that are in your lives to really think about how do they feel when they're scrolling on social media? How do they feel when they're having a private conversation with a trusted friend? And trying to help them be more mindful about their use can be really beneficial. It's also the case that teens and tweens know that we're having these conversations. They see the headlines that I put up there. They know the messaging about how social media is destroying a generation, which is incredibly sensationalized, and, in my opinion, um, unproductive. And so having a conversation with them, we should realize that they may kind of start off that conversation from a defensive standpoint. And so the extent to which we can invite them to share with us what is working on social media might provide an opportunity to have more of a dialogue about both what's working and what's not working. Um, and in terms of you know young people, 10 year olds having their first phone, again, that is, that is a whole host of challenges that we could have a whole webinar about. But I would just suggest to parents to do as much research as you can on what are the specific tools that are available to you. For example, if you wanna monitor your child's use or you wanna limit their use in certain ways, you can decide that for yourself. And it's really important that you understand what is what is available and what are the workarounds? How might your teen get around those things if that's something that they might be interested in doing? And then also, again, having those open and honest conversations about the risks, the challenges, and the potential really negative effects, both in terms of things like cyberbullying, but also in terms of things like displacement, spending all your time on screens, as well as the potential benefits, why they should use their phone and what they should think about using their phone for. Great. That's really helpful. I was intrigued, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit more about this um, as you're able to. Um, if you piqued someone's interest about the appearance-related social media consciousness, um, how you know how did we happen upon this phenomenon? How did we identify it? And beyond the sort of mindfulness strategies that we've talked about here, which I assume would be helpful in all things, are there particular things that we can do to counteract that piece um, so that we can, especially if some of this... Um, some of this phenomenon is sort of unconscious um, that we can sort of check ourselves in it and understand if it might be affecting us in negative ways. Yeah, so th that is a big focus of my research. So again, I could talk about that for many, many hours. Um, to, to try to be brief, the phenomenon in terms of our awareness of it and our understanding of it originated actually years before social media with a theory that was presented in the psychology literature called objectification theory. And it was actually developed in part by Dr. Barb Fredrickson, who's currently a professor at UNC. And part of the theory recognized that the objectification and sexualization of women in things like advertisements and traditional media, things like movies or TV shows, had a negative implication for girls and women, specifically that they were internalizing this sense of other people's viewing of their body. And then they were engaging in things like habitual body monitoring, trying to make sure that they looked good at all times, or internalizing the idea that how they look is more important than what they can do or who they are, which is a really terrible and detrimental idea, especially when we're thinking about young people trying to figure out who they are. And so appearance-related social media consciousness is really kind of that experience in this very specific social media context. And this internalization of a social media audience is potentially even more pernicious because previously, whereas people had really internalized how others were viewing them offline, now that audience is very real. It's hundreds of people looking at images of oneself potentially every day, all the time. And that internalization can lead to really negative effects. So there's very little research on this right now and how we can combat it. But in terms of kind of the offline world, how self-objectification can be potentially targeted is to really focus on thinking about the body as an, as an agent, the body as a subject and not an object. So what can I do? Can I run and jump? What can I feel and think? Thinking about ourselves as acting in the world rather than passive recipients of other people's viewpoints can be a really helpful way, again, especially for young people to think about the value of themselves and the complex values that come with 
being able to do things or say things or think things or provide things in a social context. And it's likely that some of those benefits could extend to appearance related social media consciousness as well. Great stuff there, thank you. We have a question in the Q&A. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's clear to me that you feel a genuine passion for this line of research. What experiences did you have that motivated you to pursue this research? Oh, great question. Um, I mean, a lot of my research interest really kind of starts with the experience of adolescence. And I'm really interested in understanding how human development unfolds in these broad social and cultural contexts that we all live in. And so I really started my research focusing on these experiences of young people and their development over time. And it became very clear pretty quickly that if we want to understand the experiences of youth, we have to understand the experiences that they're having online, because so much of adolescence experiences are happening in that digital space. And so that's kind of how I came to this research in terms of, you know, the path that I took. But my personal experiences with digital media have been probably pretty similar to many of the people here. I've had social media and I've felt consumed by it at different times in my life. I felt like it was hard to stop scrolling or like I was spending a lot of time on these devices in ways that I didn't really want to spend. And it was early on when I was in my graduate training and I was starting to really focus on these issues and think about them critically that I decided that I wanted to stop using social media entirely. And um, that experience and the amount of time it opened up for me and the amount of connection that I felt like I was able to have with people through things like text messaging instead of social media really helped to kind of uh, emphasize for me how valuable it is to think in an intentional way about how we want to use these tools to benefit our lives. Helpful reminders for that. I, I'm interested too in a related topic that we often ask our facilitators. Uh, so I'm I'm mindful to overuse the term that we may have some students in particular who are listening today who have said, you know, I think I might be interested in pursuing psychology as a major or um, becoming involved in this kind of research. I'm curious to know if a you have any opportunities for students to be engaged in research with you, and two if you might, if you might have some advice for an undergraduate student who is still sort of picking a path and a major and thinking about how can I sort of try this on? Uh, and if you have any recommendations uh, for a potential interest in psychology. Mm -hmm. Great questions. I, yes, I've been very passionate about psychology since I started undergrad. It was what I started majoring in. I love it as a field. It provides us with so many exciting opportunities to learn about these things that are so relevant to all of us. Um, and so, yes, I do have research opportunities in my lab. I'm just getting my labs set up since this is the first semester that I'm here at UNC, but I'm planning to have undergrads work in the lab as research assistants on a volunteer basis starting in the spring. So if anyone is interested, you can feel free to, um, if you just like Google my name, you should be able to find my website that has more information, or I can send that out later for all the attendees. And there's information there about um, the kinds of opportunities that you might have in the lab. I haven't like formally started recruiting yet, so some of that information is not yet online, but it will be shortly. And um, I'm also recruiting for a graduate student to start working in my lab next year. So anyone who's interested in pursuing a PhD in developmental psychology very soon, that you can apply to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the application is due this fall to begin next fall. And then in terms of kind of more broad advice, I think the first thing that I just want to say is that if you are in, if you are currently an undergraduate student or you're recently out of undergrad, and you're not sure where you want to go or what you want to do, that's perfectly normal. I think that there's a lot of pressure on young people to make decisions very quickly and early and sometimes before we're ready. After undergrad, I personally spent three years working in different industries and doing a bit of traveling and doing a lot of volunteering. And those experiences were really beneficial for me to gain skills, to learn what I liked, and I think more importantly, to learn what I didn't like. So if I could give you one piece of advice, it would be to try as many things as you can and value those experiences that you absolutely hate because those experiences really help you to hone in on what it is that you really love. Terrific. And I particularly love that people who are on the seminar today might have a, an advanced word on maybe working in your lab with you. So you heard it here first, folks. Um, get involved. That's terrific. 
Um, I know that you have to leave us just a few minutes early today, so I'm very mindful of keeping you on time. I do have a closing question, so that's just a warning. If anybody um, has any last minute burning desire to get in on the Q&A, please throw that in there and we'll try to get it answered. But maybe a future focused question to sort of close us off. So as you envision the future and our intersection between mental health and technology, are there changes or innovations that you would either like to see in the field um, or things that you anticipate might be coming soon that we can be watching out for? Mm, great question. Um, I guess two things. In terms of the research, one thing that I think is really important and that we're starting to move in the direction of is to think about heterogeneity, which is a fancy way to say how people are different. And so one thing that we've done in a lot of the research so far is just try to understand on average, how do people respond to different behaviors online? But we know that people are different based on all kinds of different characteristics or prior experiences or identities, or just maybe uh, people have different preferences for how they engage in digital media and trying to understand how different ways of using digital media might have different impacts for different people is a really complex question, but one that really requires our attention, especially as we're trying to understand who is potentially most at risk for really severe negative mental health outcomes related to using digital media. Um, I think there was a second part of that question that I may have missed. Oh, what, what else do I think is, is um, coming? I don't know what's coming, but I know that um, currently Congress is working on a new policy. It's called the Kids Online Safety Act. It is um, limited and not comprehensive, but it is a start in terms of thinking about how government could potentially regulate tech companies to make them work better for us and less for their own profits. And so it hasn't been passed yet. It actually failed previously, and it's still going through kind of a second round um, in the Senate. But it's one potential way that there may be changes coming that could potentially help us, and especially for young people, help them to have um, a better kind of structure and scaffolding around how they're accessing these technologies. Really great. Thank you for that. Well, I just want to um, thank you again, uh, Annie, for all of your guidance and your good counsel and your um, thought-provoking wisdom for us today. And I hope that folks take advantage of the additional resources. As promised, we will definitely um, steal that information from you and put it up on our um, website, on the Heals Care Network website, which is care.unc.edu. And I see that we have an up our upcoming mental health seminar for November. So if you're interested in that, please go to, again, in our Heals Care Network website, there's that information and more events. So if you're interested in participating in the conversation, please go check that out. Thank you again, Annie. Thank you to our colleagues, Sarah Stallman and Jesus Enriquez, who are behind the scenes making this all go and look so seamless. Thanks to all of you who have participated. And I will say just a couple of other things. We're going to throw up perfect our CLE credit QR code. So if you have joined us today for CLE credit, there is your code. Um, feel free to use that. And there there's another opportunity for folks to get engaged if they are interested in this topic and potentially are looking for a peer um, advisory role. Our listener students who help us manage our online chat function on um, Heals Care Network, uh, uh, we are taking interested parties. So please feel free to either write to us through the Heals Care Network. You can also email me uh, directly or any member of our student affairs team and we can get you connected there. So thanks again so much, Annie really appreciate your support and good counsel today and we'll hope to have you with us maybe for a future session as well because I have a feeling this is going to be a, a particularly popular uh, interest area of interest and one that folks may want to come back to so all the best take good care everyone be well take care of yourselves and each other thanks so much thanks everyone take care